Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are continuing our deliberations on H18, an act relating to sexual exploitation of children. And when we last met, uh, the Attorney General's Office and the Defender General's Office had both uh, testified and uh, had proposed to meet in the um, interim and uh, hopefully come up with some, some language, some compromise language to move the bill forward. Uh, and so I thought uh, while we're waiting for Professor Teach out, perhaps we could hear from uh, both the Attorney General's office and the Defender General's office and starting with, um, with David Scher. I know we have some time, uh, time constraints. So, uh, so good morning, David, welcome. And you and why don't you start and then hear from Marshall as well. Regarding sure. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, David Sher with the Attorney General's Office. The update is pretty brief. We did meet yesterday and talked about possible uh, um, compromise language. Our office is now working on reviewing that. We just have to be careful with this stuff, make sure that no changes will affect the way we currently do business in the current prosecution. So, so we're doing some careful thinking about those, and we hope to either bring something back to the committee or uh, circle back with Marshall for further discussion, you know, in the next day or so. Uh, apologies, we haven't been able to close that circle just yet. Um, I, I absolutely appreciate your work on it and, and understand that things seem to be more challenging all around these days. So I thank you. Uh, Marshall. I agree with everything that uh, David just said. We reached an agreement on some language and he had to run it through his criminal division. And my understanding is that's what's, that's what's going on. So I, other than that, I have nothing to report. Okay, all right, well, great. Again, I appreciate it. And we'll try to get you back in maybe later this week. All right. Okay. And all right, thank you. Thank you so much. And I do see Professor Teach out connecting in a minute. Good morning. Good morning, Professor. Oh, I can't, actually, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Let me see if I can un unmute you. Okay, there we go. I apologize. Uh, apparently we did not have Zoom downloaded on my office computer so i was delayed in making contact um, no worries it's always good to see you thank thank you so much for for being available uh to to speak with us this morning and give us a little constitutional law primer um, as you know we're working on h18 regarding the sexual exploitation of of children and um you can introduce yourself for the record and, um, and talk to us about the bill. Appreciate it, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I have prepared about three pages of written testimony, which I would like to submit for the record. Excellent. My name is Peter Teachout. I'm a professor of constitutional law at Vermont Law School. And I am going to track but not read my written testimony uh, this morning. Hold on just a minute while I pull it up. Great. Thank you. And then um, if you when you when you're able to submit it um, to Mike Bailey, we'll also post it on our on our committee page. Okay. I've got to find it now. Hold on just one second please. There it is. Okay. So the question before the House Judiciary Committee, Madam Chair, as I understand it, is whether H18, which would add simulation to the list of prohibited conduct in Vermont sexual abuse of children statute would be found to violate the free speech protections under the First Amendment. Now, the language of the proposed amendment that I have may not still be the language of the amendment today. But under paragraph seven, as I have it, it reads as follows. Simulation means the explicit depiction of any conduct described above that creates the appearance of such conduct and that exhibits the uncovered portion of the breast, genitals, 
or buttocks. I just, I understand that there might have been some negotiations about changes in that language, but my testimony has got to be based on the form of the paragraph seven that I received. Uh, I am going to suggest that to avoid possible constitutional problems, the language of paragraph seven be changed to read as follows. Paragraph seven, quote, simulation means the explicit depiction of any conduct described above that creates the appearance that children participated in the conduct and involved the use of actual children in the production of the depictions of sexual conduct. And the basic thrust of my testimony, which is not terribly long, is that I think those changes are necessary to avoid potential constitutional challenges. So in my written testimony, I start off to describe that normally sexually de depictions of sexually explicit conduct are protected speech under the First Amendment with the narrow exception of what's called technical obscenity, which is defined by the Supreme Court in a case called Miller versus California, which said not protected speech, if the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest is judged by local community standards and depicts sexual conduct in a patently offensive way and has no or lacks serious artistic, literary, or scientific value. Now in the Ferber case, the court dealt with a New York statute that made production and distribution of child pornography a crime. And in that case, very importantly, the court suspended the requirements that normally apply, said those requirements don't apply to child pornography. And the reason was because the court found the state had a compelling interest in protecting children from the physical and psychological damage suffered from being used in the production of sexually explicit material. That's really important. That's the rationale. We're going to suspend the normal requirements because the state has a compelling interest in preventing the harm suffered by children in the actual production of the depictions of sexual conduct. Now that rationale was reaffirmed in a case called Ashcraft versus Free Speech Coalition. In that case, the court struck down a provision in a federal statute that criminalized the production and distribution of digital images, what we would call virtual child pornography, where the images conveyed the appearance of minors engaging in sexually explicit conduct but it did so in a wide range of conduct, a context, including those in which adults were involved, pretending to be children, including those where the material had been digitally manipulated to make it appear as if children had been involved in the production when in fact they hadn't. And the court struck down that provision saying it covered a lot of depictions of sexually explicit conduct that did not fall within the narrow confines of the Ferbert ruling because it covered situations where children had not actually been used in the production of the material. Thus, there was no compelling interest in censoring this material because the compelling interest is preventing the harm that occurs to children who are involved in the production of the material. So, why, how does that apply then to paragraph seven? If we apply the ruling of the court's decisions in the Ferber case and the Ashcraft case to the proposed amendment as written, it raises two questions. The first question, probably not terribly significant, but the first question is whether simulations of sex, depictions of sexual conduct should be treated the same as actual depictions of actual sexual conduct. And if we look at the cases, we find that the court has said, at least with respect to depictions of sexual intercourse of the ultimate sexual act, the court itself has treated both simulations and actual conduct as interchangeable. Whether 
that would be extended to the other forms of sexual conduct that are prohibited under Vermont's child sexual abuse statute. I am not sure, there are no court rulings, but I think it's highly likely the court would extend the same treatment to depictions of other forms of sexual conduct included in that statute with the possible exception of one provision, which I think describes as prohibited sexual conduct, what we used to call petting, but it is touching of the, I think the breast, the uncovered portions of the breast with an intent to arouse desire. I'm not sure whether the court in that area would, would say simulations ought to be treated the same as depictions of actual conduct, but I think that's really a minor matter and we need not be concerned with it today. The big question is whether the statute, the proposed paragraph seven uh, would meet the requirements of the Ferber case and the Ashcroft case. And I don't think that they do. Hold on just a second while I change my screen. So, uh, the problem with paragraph seven, at least in the version I've been given, that it would make a crime to produce or distribute de depictions of simulations whenever those simulations create the appearance of such conduct, even when no children may have been involved in the production of the simulations. For example, I think it would cover simulations using adults who appear to be children, if that's the impression that's given. I think it would include simulations involving or using images of children which have been manipulated to make it appear as if children, perhaps even real children are engaging in the conduct even though they were not involved in the production of the simulations. Images involved, but not the children themselves. If children have not actually been used in the production of the simulations, I think then the Vermont, the proposal paragraph seven is written goes too far. It would go beyond the justification the court finds in the Ferber case and again in the Ashcraft case for allowing that uh, people who produce and distribute sexually explicit material be prosecuted under child sexual abuse laws. So that's why I suggest we amend the paragraph to basically provide it is those situations where the depiction creates the appearance that children participated in the conduct and importantly involve the use of actual children in the production of the depictions of sexual conduct. That would bring, I think, paragraph seven in line with the court's rulings in the Ferber and Ashcroft cases. But it's important to see it would have some consequences and the committee might not want those consequences. If the simulation paragraph were amended as I propose, it could no longer be used as a basis for prosecuting those who produce and distribute depictions of sexual conduct that create the appearance that children participated in the conduct if adults instead of children were used, or if images of children were manipulated to make it appear as if they were engaged in the conduct, even though children themselves were not used in the production of the simulations. I wanna stress that the change that I'm suggesting distinguishes between the use of images of actual children, not made criminal, and the use of actual children in the production of the simulations. I'm not sure that's what the committee wants to do, but, but I think that would be a consequence if my proposed suggested changes in the language of paragraph seven were adopted. I have just one final point that I would like to make. You may have noticed that in my proposed amendment, I eliminate reference to uncovered portion of the breast, genitals, or buttocks in paragraph seven. I do so for two or three reasons. One, I don't see why that's necessary from a constitutional standpoint. I don't see what First Amendment purpose it serves. I also do so because I don't think it's at all clear. I don't know what an uncovered portion of the breasts is. 
displaying a little cleavage is the portion of breast revealed when somebody wears a bikini uncovered. It just is not clear. Uncovered means that portion of the breast that's not covered, but that is not very clear. There are other ways if you want to go there of describing that which should not be revealed or should not be involved. But I do so primarily because I think when you add that language, it would limit some of the situations for prosecuting simulations of sexual conduct with minors that ought to be prohibited. I'm going to give you a simple example. Take a, a video that depicts a large adult male pulling what appears to be a child's head toward his crotch area after he's unbuckled his belt and unzipped his fly. No. No flesh shown, but that has, okay. The camera then shifts to focus on the man's face who appears to be having an orgasm, okay. Is that simulated fellatio? Yes, it is, okay. Would it be covered by paragraph seven as written? And he answers, I don't think it would be because there's no uncovered portion of the genitals or breasts or buttocks involved. I think that's a classic example of simulated sexual conduct that probably ought to be prohibited by the Vermont statute. Would it be covered by the proposed change in the language of the statute that I've suggested? Yes, it would, because it would create the appearance that a child had participated in the conduct and involve the use of an actual child in the production of the depictions of that conduct. So is it a simulation? Sure, it's a simulation of Fladio, but it certainly would not fall within the definition of simulation under paragraph seven as it exists. So that's the basic thrust of my testimony. I'm sorry for having rushed through it. I think my written testimony may be a little bit more helpful, but that's the basic thrust of my view of whether or not paragraph seven is written is likely to encounter problems under First Amendment law. Great, no, thank you. I appreciate that very much. And um, also looking forward to, to actually seeing the language um, and Mike will, um, will post it um, when he can. I, since we do have, I'm not seeing any hands from committee members, but we also do have legislative counsel here and the um, attorney general's office uh, proposer of the, uh, of the bill. Just wanna give people a chance to any questions or comments, Michelle? Let's start with you. Just want to make sure you, while well, we have Professor Teach out here. Yep. Sorry about that. I'm just flipping my there. So um, I think the the I would disagree with regard to the inclusion or uh, center. I mean, sorry, Professor Teach out's uh, suggestion that you didn't need the nudity portions. Um, I think it's important with regard to narrowing the scope. Um, and the, with regard to the simulation, because when we had been talking about this earlier and the Defender General's office brought up the idea that there may be, um, you know, a movie on Netflix or something like that, something that you're not intending to sweep in. Um, and we want to make sure that we're, that we're keeping this as narrow as possible. And so I think that the nudity provisions help a lot. And that's a big difference from the language that was offered last year. Um, if it's a, you know, the issue of what, what constitutes the uncovered portion of the breast, um, there, you know, you can play around with that definition. If you look at the voyeurism law um, that y'all passed maybe about a decade ago, um, I think I'll, I'll go back and check, but I think the definition is slightly different than what was proposed here um, by the attorney general's office. I think it's like the, the, uh, the breast below the areola or something like that, but we could look to other, you know, portions there. And if that's more comfortable for people and we, we would use an, an existing definition is probably a better idea and we can bring that in and tweak it. But I do think that the language uh, with regard to the nudity is an important part of that. And with regard to the actual child bed, I think, you know, we've discussed this quite a bit and I think we all agree that um, it does have to be an actual child uh, involved in the simulation. I don't think anybody has disagreed about that. It's just a matter of 
um, discussing between the stakeholders about where we want to clarify that. Do we want to do it in the definition of child in the definition section? You know, um, I tend to not like, I mean, some, we do that and you can have a different definitions of child throughout the statutes and a, and a child can mean you know, a person under the age of 18 and one title, and it can mean someone under 16 and another section and another title, but um, generally nowhere, you know, in, in, throughout the statutes does the definition of a child mean anything other than a real actual living child. And so I think my preference would probably be to, to leave that definition and then incorporate, you know, into the language that the that it is an actual child someone somewhere in there but I think we're all in agreement of that I think it's just a matter of the DG and the AG discussing about how what they're most comfortable with tweaking it and do we do we go just narrowly with regard to the simulation and clarifying that it's an actual child or do we do it where it's more comprehensive with regard to the whole chapter well thank, thank you Michelle, I always enjoy our discussions and I'm glad that you push back just a little bit. Uh, I think you have to ask the question of the hypothetical I gave, mm -hmm. of which is sort of a convention in a lot of uh, films where you have a large adult male that pushes the head of a child or some other female victim into the crotch area, unbuckles the belt, and then a, and then the camera shifts to the man's face and he appears to be having an orgasm. If actual children are used in the production of that simulation, shouldn't the Vermont statute prohibit that? Because there you've got harm to the children that are involved in the simulation, which is the rationale under Ferber, and therefore the state would have a compelling interest in preventing that kind of harm. I just raised that question, and I don't think when you narrow the statute the way you've sought to do, it would cover that situation. Uh, there are other, you can deal with the bare breast problem. We can find a definition that makes it a little more specific. It usually has to deal with, you know, down to just above the nipple or something like that. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. And I think, um, and I think it's a good policy discussion for the committee to have around that. I think I, I would like to hear perhaps from Marshall and David around the issue um, and, and kind of think about the, the flip side because, uh, I don't, one of the issues that we were really struggling with and why this issue didn't get resolved last session was because we weren't quite sure how to get at the uh, conduct that they wanted to prohibit without it being too broad. And, um, and so we've kind of felt that the nudity portion was important to make sure that it didn't unintentionally sweep in stuff uh, that we didn't want in there. So, but thank you, I appreciate it. Before I turn to Barbara, um, just David or Marshall, if you want to. Sure, so I'll chime in. I agree with Professor Teachout around the inclusion of language that makes it clear that what we're talking about is an actual child. Um, that's, been, that's been one of my arguments all the way through this. I think as far as the, the language around nudity, the reason why I think it's important to have that language in there is because there's the, the, there's a lot of actually like really mainstream movies, movies that are on, you know, lists of the hundred best movies of all time, that that language, if, if there was no nudity language in there, then this statute would sweep it in. Like, for example, uh, the movie Taxi Driver. Jodie Foster was 12 years old when Taxi Driver was filmed. And that certainly has simulated sexual intercourse, um, but not sexual intercourse that shows any nudity. It uh, doesn't show any explicit depiction of the genitals. Now, Taxi Driver is a movie that's available on Netflix. It's a, or maybe not Netflix, but it's on uh, it's on Amazon Prime anyway. And it's you know a highly regarded movie. I I think it's even in the Criterion collection. I mean it's. You know, it's, it would be really problematic for us to criminalize possession of taxi drivers. Same is true uh, a year or two before Taxi Driver was the movie Sherry Baby, which had, uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember the actress. 
but it was it was a deal. Yes, that's correct. Um, and and she was certainly underage in that movie, and that involved simulated depictions of uh, of of intercourse. So did in uh, 1994 the movie Kids, which I think was one of the first. Uh, one of the first movies released into theaters to get an NC-17 rating. Uh, that was filmed when Rosario Dawson was only 14. Um, and that certainly included depictions of, uh, of uh, simulated sexual intercourse. And that movie went on to win awards. There was a movie last year out of Vietnam called The Third Wife um, that won at Sundance and was you know, internationally successful. Um, and it was controversial because it included some very, de uh, very uh, explicit depictions of sexual intercourse involving a 13 year old actress. So I think that if we, you know, but the, the one thing that all those movies have in common is that those depictions don't involve uh, exposure of the genitals or breasts. And so I think that in order to avoid sweeping in that kind of you know, mainstream, mainstream sort of, uh, you know, typical popular movie uh, that we need something in there that, 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 that separates those from what we're actually trying to get at. And I agree that the, the language around nudity is not very clear. Um, and I would also be interested if there's some other way to kind of separate out what we're trying to get at versus the, you know, sort of mainstream commercial productions that do involve young actors and actresses and do involve simulations of uh, sexual activity. If there was some better way to do that, uh, I'd certainly be interested in considering that. I think that just through this process, this is what we've come up with as the best way to uh, kind of filter those out so far. and understanding that that may mean filtering out some of the kind of stuff that is, you know, really objectionable and that, um, you know, I think that a lot of people would want to see criminalized. But I think that goes back to some of the, uh, you know, I think I submitted in my testimony last time, I submitted some written testimony with uh, an example of a facial challenge to a case that just had some great language around why we, why the presumptions in First Amendment cases, certain of the presumptions of constitutionality and the burdens of proof are flipped. And part of what the court in that case said was that um, when you're talking about First Amendment free speech cases, that it's way more important to be under-inclusive than over-inclusive. And that over-inclusive is actually where you start to get into the prospect of a facial challenge and invalidating a statute. So that's my argument for keeping the nudity provision in there or something like it. If we can come up with some other way to, to sort out the, what we're after from what we really can't be criminalizing, I'm absolutely open to other suggestions. Um, but I think we have to do something that separates those out. Thank you, Marshall. Appreciate it. David, and then we'll get to you, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, appreciate your testimony here today. And uh, um, the piece that I, and I think the first two witnesses who spoke um, addressed the nudity aspect of it well, and I, I uh, appreciate your concern and happy to think about ways that we can define that more clearly. One question I had that I wanted to focus on briefly is the actual child aspect of it, which, uh, as folks have said, has been the subject of a lot of discussion. Our reading of the statutory scheme broadly, uh, not broadly, of the statutory scheme in this chapter, I should say, limited to chapter 64 of Title 13, is that the definitions already limit any unlawful behavior to the to an actual child. In other words, in the definition section, which the bill only has you know a piece of the the definition section uh, subsection one of the definition section twenty eight twenty one, um, 
which is, as I said, not in the bill, but obviously in, in the statute, defines a child as any person under 16 years of age. And the, um, the statutes that actually define the criminal behavior later in the chapter uh, use the term child. So it's always been our reading of the law that um, the statutes are already limited only to those circumstances that involve a person, a human being, who is under 16. And because of that, the, um, we couldn't be, you know, adding the simulated section does not allow, um, simu the simulations have to uh, involve an actual child because that is how child was defined for the purposes of the chapter. Um, and so that had always been our, our read of the statute. I think there, uh, you know, that that's been one of the key questions here is that matter of statutory interpretation really as much, uh, I think we're actually, there's a lot of agreement on the constitutional interpretation. Uh, there's been some difference on the statutory interpretation side of it in terms of bill drafting. And just was wondering what your thoughts were on that potential reading of the statutes. Well, you're David, right? I am, yes. Hi, pleased to meet you. Look, look, I'm just reading the language of the statute. And I think you're right that possibly if you read the rest of the statute, it clearly only applies where an actual child is involved. Although section seven does not say that, right? It says the requirement is it creates the appearance that children or the appearance creates the appearance of such conduct, something like that, right? Okay, so I've got two situations. One is where an adult appears in a video production, appears to be a child, right? That clearly wouldn't be covered as you, at least with your reading, because you've somehow worked in the actual child must be involved. But there are also situations where you can manipulate uh, digitally manipulate images to take an actual child, an image of an actual child, right? And make it appear as if that child is engaging in sexual conduct when the actual child in fact has not been used or abused in the production of the simulation. You just grab it out of a catalog or something like that. Now, do you wanna cover that or not? I think if you want to cover that, you're going to run into trouble under Ashcroft because Ashcroft said, you know, that's one of the problems. This statute, this provision in the statute doesn't eliminate the problem of it being applied to manipul digitally manipulated images where children were not actually involved in the production of the simulation. So I think you somehow have to, that's my view, that even if you got actual children or images of actual children, not enough, You've got to limit it to those situations where children have actually been used in the production of the simulation. That's that's my that's my response to what you just asked. Thank you, Professor. And and, and this is one of the pieces that we are working on in terms of uh, potential um, clarification. So I appreciate your your thoughts on that, and and uh, we will keep working on that. Thank you. Okay, and if I could respond briefly, Madam Chair, to, I believe it was Marshall's comments. I, I, think, those, yeah. I think those are well well taken. And I just, just watched Taxi Driver last week. So I'm very much aware of, of that move. I, you know, the problem is, and it might be a difficult line to draw statutorily, is you don't want to prohibit the legitimate use of children in simulated sexual activity, legitimate use, but you want to avoid the abuse of children in the production of child porn. So how do you, you know, how do you draw that line? And the effort is, well, what if we put in some requirement of nudity? I'm not sure whether that makes the kind of distinction you want to make, but at least, you know, you want to I, I think your point was a valid one, Marshall, and, and also Michelle about at least explains why you've got the nudity requirement in paragraph seven. I don't like it because I think it eliminates situations where no nudity is involved and children are clearly being abused and you want to allow the prosecution of those who abuse those children in the context of 
producing depictions, simulated or otherwise, of sexual conduct. Thank you. Is, Michelle, did you want to chime in or I wasn't sure if you wanted to chime in or if not, I'll- No, I'll but I think, okay. I think everybody's covered yeah. that. Yeah, okay, great. All right, Barbara, thank you so much for your, for your patience. <laughs> thank oh, you. No problem, it, it, it actually circled around too. Professor Teacher just touched on um, the issue I wanted to ask. So let's look at the situation again of Photoshopping in a real child into a production. Um, so if the law is about the interest of the child, the harm didn't come in that case from the making of the film, but I am concerned about potential harm that comes once that film is distributed and that child may be put at certain kinds of risk. Um, because, well, I don't know. I think being a social worker and having worked with kids that have been vulnerable um, just raises an, an antenna for me about, oh my gosh, Susie Jones, you know, lives in our town and we know she likes sex even though she's eight. So like, I, I just worry about that harm. And in your discussion right now, um, back and forth, that it yesterday we had a training on um, implicit bias. And one of the videos we saw that was very powerful involved using a little girl and having her um, dressed in different makeup and clothing to see how people would react to her. And they had to stop because the little girl got pretty upset. And so that made me start thinking about okay, we're focused on sex, but what about a, a child in a movie where there's like violence? Like, are we, are we trying to follow the what's upsetting to child actors? Um, because it is bigger than just this. And again, I know the importance of the First Amendment. So I'm just curious to get your take on those sort of two variables. Well, thank you, uh, and, and Representative Barbara, what is, uh, Rich, Rachelson, is it? Yes. Rachelson, yes. Let's deal with your two questions in order. Okay. The first question I think is very valid. And we find it reflected, discussed, but not decided in the Ashcraft case. There were two provisions in the federal statute. One just said, prohibited or made criminal all forms of digital manipulation of videos that simply made it appear that children were involved, whether adult actors were involved, whether they took artificial people and just you turn them into looking like real children, it covered those. And the court said, no, this goes far beyond Ferber because Ferber was based on the notion that children are harmed by, the, by being involved in the production of the material. But it's interesting that there was another provision in that same federal statute that the court said, we are not going to consider it because it's not been raised in this challenge. But it looked at the second kind of harm that you just identified. That is where the image of an actual identifiable child is involved, even though it might have been manipulated into a scene that looks like it. And they said that kind of harm, and the court just suggested it, looks to us more like the kind of harm that was involved in Ferber, which is your point, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to decide that. But that's an interesting question. So we might think about in this statute whether we want to you know, include not just what I have included where actual children are involved in the production or where the image of an actual child is used in the simulation, I, you know, uh, in a way that would do damage long-term to that child, especially in smaller communities if that image were clearly identifiable. So I agree with you. There, there, I think there's room within Ferber and the Ferber-Ashcraft framework to prohibit that as well, although the court itself hasn't ruled on it. And now your second concern was, I think there's a movie called Cuties. 
a French movie. Some of our congressional representatives in Washington think that it's a movie showing young French girls, many of whom from sort of minority communities are making all sorts of moves and engaged in all sorts of sexually suggestive moves. And some people in Washington think that constitutes child pornography. Now, it, it's not child pornography as we know it, but, and it wouldn't be covered by this statute. I don't really know how to, how to deal with that, uh, that question, but, but I think it's a legitimate one. It goes, I think, far beyond what, what this particular sexual abuse statute is intended to deal with. Does that help at all? No. I mean, that one again is sexual, is sexual. So again, let's say it's the little girl's gonna get blown up into 12 pieces. Um, and, you know, that's, and she's seeing her leg in one side of the room or, you know, or some horrible Freddy Krieger is gonna do something to her. Like, I, I know we're sort of triggered by sex, but what about like intense violence that might give a kid incredible nightmares? I mean. That is a real problem with American First Amendment law. Depictions of sexual conduct, if they're raunchy enough, hardcore enough, fall outside First Amendment protection. But the court, interestingly, has refused to say depictions of violence, you know, violent video games and so on, fall outside First Amendment protection. It's a peculiarity of American culture in some ways. Depictions of violence, protected speech, depictions of raunchy sexual conduct, not protected. It seems perverse to us, but that's that's the simple answer. So, so if we had a scene where we someone goes in and blows up a uh, infant childcare center, and they use real children for it, no big deal, right? Under First Amendment, I mean, there's no, there, there's no. Maybe there's child labor law or something, but I can't. There's nothing that would stop that. The use of children in depictions of violence, as far as I know, as far as all of the court's cases so far indicate, not, I mean, is protected under the First Amendment. Unless their clothes blow off. There was a very famous case involving a, a California law that limited access by, uh, by minors to violent video games. Court struck it down, uh, right. uh, invoking Grimm's fairy tales as a basis for doing so. <laughs> huh? Hey, look, I, we inherit this stuff, but that is one of the oddities of American First Amendment law, depictions of violence, protected speech, depictions of certain kinds of really raunchy, dirty, sexual, hardcore porn, not protected. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I'm not seeing hands, but I want to give people just an opportunity. Nope. I don't think so. Well, Professor Teachout, thank you so much. This is really Madam Madam Chair, oh, uh, look like look like Marshall had his hand up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, Marshall, you know, I, thank you. I did. I just had a brief response to Representative Rachelson's <clears throat> question, and it says not really a response about the law, but just the practicality of it, um, is that I have a good friend who works as a tutor for child actors on uh, movie sets and TV sets. Um, and what he's told me is that there's basically two things that protect kids in those situations. One is that they, they're actually very careful about, it. so I, we're talking mainstream movies here, they're very careful about making sure that children are exposed to that kind of stuff. And then a lot of kids don't actually, a lot of child actors, I should say, don't actually see the movies they're in until they're much older. And they're, they're not, you know, scenes of violence are typically very carefully screened so that the child actors don't see the violence. Um, and that 
in less professional productions, uh, people have actually been charged with things like cruelty to a child for failing to take those kinds of precautions. Um, now that doesn't address what you're talking about here because you know these statutes prohibit and they criminalize not just aspects of how things are produced, but also possession. Um, so this wouldn't, you know, you couldn't do anything here that would criminalize possession of a movie that had a child actor who was exposed to something. Um, but if, for example, someone were to make a movie in Vermont um, and were to use a child actor in a way where they were exposed to really grievous violence or something like that, there's potential that they could be charged under cruelty to a child or child endangerment, um, or that it could become a child welfare issue uh, where the child's parents, whether they are the people producing the, uh, the movie or not, um, could be held responsible for allowing their child to be so exposed. Um, so I, I think that would just be the, the quick answer to that. I, so Chairman Gr yeah. Gr Grad, if I could make just one final comment and then I will be happy to be relieved of duty. <laughs> You I'm can trying, make as many comments as you'd like. <laughs> I'm, try, you. I'm trying to thread the needle between wanting to make possible criminal prosecution of those who produce and distribute simulations of sexual conduct when children are actually being abused in the production and the kind of simulations we see in movies like Taxi Driver. Uh, I'm sure there are hundreds of other movies where, and it seems to me what you can do, it is not constitutionally required, but it certainly is possible, is just build into the Vermont statute, something like the third Miller requirement, provided that works that have serious literary, artistic, social or scientific value will not be subject, I don't know what, it, it, that will be a defense to prosecutions under this provision. You could build that right in. And it seems to me that would be a way of shifting out those legitimate films that simulate sexual conduct and activity, but also not make that defense available to the scumbags that produce child porn. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, great. Thank you so much. Again, I really appreciate you being with us and helping us think through this. So, and do, do take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, committee, why don't we um, take a break and come back at, uh, how about 10 after 10, please? So again, uh, turn your, we will remain on live um, on YouTube. So just turn your videos off and uh, see you soon. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, a few things. Um, so there's justice reinvestment to the report. And so one question would be whether or not um, Representative Emmons committee and our committee, Maybe we want to do that together. I don't know if we could also bring in Senate Judiciary. Ideally, that would be the way to go, but I'm not sure, but that's, I think that would be helpful for the committee to hear hear that. Okay. And then we've got, um, and then on the 28th with the Senate, that's, is that the um, racial disparities? Is that what that is? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, and then I need to get back to Aton about um, February 9th, maybe I think is their meeting, but I think it'd be great if those if the committee members who could make it if we if we could go. Um, so at the very least, if uh, our committee can do that, it'd be great if if uh, Senate Judiciary could do that as well. Yeah, it's the 9th at 6 p.m. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and then we would adjust our day 
if um, if people are able to do that. And then um, does Mike does four o'clock tomorrow work for you? Assuming it works for Tom and Coach, should we try to keep to four o'clock for scheduling? Yeah, that sure. should work for me. Okay, great. All right, I think that's all I have for now. And then, and like okay. I said earlier, contact list would be great for the committee, and hopefully, folks have given you their their contacts and let you yeah. know they're not. Um, how far were we? Go? I don't remember when uh, we did last week when we did our four o'clock. Uh, was that live or no? No, no. Okay. Yeah. It was on Zoom, but it was not live. Right. Yeah. So, Madam Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I I did speak to uh, Sarah Coffey, um, uh, just to. Uh, bring her up to speed with some of the uh, work we're doing uh, as far as witnesses. Uh, and she was meeting with uh, her chair um, this morning um, because, you know, I think we're all in agreement anytime that we can coordinate uh, committee um, meetings with the same witnesses, especially. Um, it, it makes sense. So I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, they're actively <laughs> thinking in those terms too. Great, good, thank you. Good, I appreciate that, great, thank you. Okay, so it looks like most of our committees are back on. Uh, okay. So in terms of um, H18, I thought that, you know, this morning was very helpful. I think we're at a, uh, well, I think we'll take a, a pause and let the Attorney General and Defender General's office uh, work together and work with Michelle, um, come back with, um, come back with some language. And uh, so, Michelle, so I, so I think in terms of today, I think we're all set uh, for H18 and just see see where folks get, but. That sounds good. As soon as I have something, I will uh, I'll let you know so you can get it rescheduled. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Sure. And, uh, thank you, Marshall. Uh, Tom, I thought, I, did you, your hand went up and then. Yeah, I, uh, I'm just gonna assume that uh, Professor Teachout's language will be just looked at also just to, incorporate potentially incorporate everything i guess or not incorporate everything but just to, just uh just a little more information i guess potential potential language uh, no ab absolutely and yeah. um, and again i haven't checked to see if it's posted but uh right. but hopefully it, it will be posted on our on our website and also if um if committee members, if you're interested in reading any of the cases that have been discussed, please let Michelle know and she'll, um, she can email you those, the cases. Um, certainly not required reading, but some of us enjoy, <laughs> enjoy reading those cases. So, um, okay, great. And then, um, so we're obviously ahead of schedule, which is not necessarily 